Do you have some fallen fellow students that are still outside? If this were the British Parliament, there would be kind of jingle bells saying, hello, everybody. Can there is an important vote? <laughs> okay, what we're going to deal with in this, in this, uh, in this um, next uh, hour would be international transport law and insurance. And uh, that might not seem to be a most so sexy subject, but also it's important in practical life because um, you have this uh, liability for transport companies it's much less than the, than y you might think and but that also has some very practical explanations so actually what uh, questions do the transport conventions address and also sad to you when everybody everybody's happy there is no queuing on the road uh, the weather is nice uh, Everybody knows exactly to do, have uh, full control of all the uh, actors in international transport. That this might not be a, a big issue, but if you base your uh, international logistics on this, then, then that you're at best extremely naive. That's my uh, um, that's uh, well, I would um, I, I would um, mean that that's important to be aware of. And also, I it's very important that you do have chains, uh, uh, chains in uh, transport chains. As I said to you, the, the freight forwarding companies, often those you are dealing with, I mean in companies like DB Chanker, uh, DHL, uh, Kieran Nagel, um, Bring to, to take a Norwegian company, Mask, whatever. Well, Mask is a bit different because they do have their own ships, but they may also provide service outside the box uh, for tr hiring uh, space on trains, airplanes and so forth. Do they act as a principal or an agent? If you act as a principal, you act on behalf of everybody else. So, what does that mean? Uh, I rep represent Kinnenagel, I use trucks from Norwegian Holders Association, I use uh, boats, uh, trains and so forth, all means of transport. But if something goes wrong, I take the blame. blame. I face the music, whereas if I act as an agent, I say, okay, I, uh, I, this I uh, booked this uh, place on your boat at Mediterranean Shipping Company, something went wrong. Do would you say that uh, Mediterranean sh shipping company is an ins in service company? Well, if not, y you should uh, deal with them directly. Then I just organize. I, I don't take the responsibility for the subcontractors. So, how about uh, damages being loss or uh, or damage? You should be aware of the fact that, at least for those of you in, in Norway, you know that uh, bad weather, uh, storms, um, um, uh, f uh, all the hurricanes, this kind of things that do happen. But nevertheless, the risk in international transport for this uh, accident happens at, at statistically speaking, at least four times as high. How about delay? <coughs> this on time in time is uh, extremely important in international logistics today. Uh, and uh, for example, in the auto business, it's extremely uh, they are uh, the level of tolerance for goods being delayed is extremely low. If you are f five minutes, ten minutes too late delivering goods to 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 Volvo, you get the penalty. For example. Uh, you have another say we can have a um, time frame of one hour. So, uh, but of course, as with um, German car manufacturing, if you don't have the goods coming just on time, you have 300 uh, employees just standing there waiting, and you could just uh, imagine the, the the cost for these pe people being unproductive. And then this is also important because. In transport law, you're uh, you compensated according to the weight of the goods. 
meaning to, to put it um, to exaggerate that as a transport company you don't give a damn about the commercial value of the goods you take into account the weight and how come it's like that because when you speak of exporters importers of goods that you just compensate me for the weight I have these high tech computers uh, and this extremely valuable uh, electronic equipment and you said it's 10 kilos and you gave me according to that it's just a trifle of the, the commercial value well actually if the transport companies you have in a custody goods who are being worth mm, billions of kroners each year if they should um, if they can should compensate you in fully and if uh, such accident happens I, I can guarantee that, that the transport costs would be much much higher and that will lead to the transport insurance companies so if you as an export company want to ensure the real uh, the commercial value of the goods you should have a transport insurance and that goes hand in hand with transport risk and that we should come back to in a, light, in a latest hour during uh, when speaking of um, Incoterms. Okay, so these are the topics we're going to deal with. Multimodal transport. You know, for many practical occasions, we have you may have, have a land leg. Uh, you use sort of trucks, rail on that trail. You have a sea leg. You may also have, um, of course, air freight. Um, and you say, well, then our hypothesis is that uh, well, you also have a international rules covering uh, multinational tr transport but then the snag is that you have um, the various international rules that are being signed by the countries and are applied are unimodal meaning that they're just covering one specific mode of transport that is the point of departure so you have for air the Montreal Convention in the former Warsaw Convention you have CMR for uh, roads uh, transport prevailing mostly inside Europe you have CIM for rail transport at sea it's quite complicated because you have various co conventions prevailing in e various countries so that you may say well that should be the job of the lawyers to find out uh, what rules prevail but you have for example um, the Hague rules, the Whisby rules, the Dam Hamburg rules, uh, and all the Rotterdam rules, but uh, they have to be signed by enough countries. For example, the British are extremely conservative in this sense. They have not uh, uh, recognized the Rotterdam rules. I think the Americans and the Chinese have, so some of the big trading nations have, but you should be aware of this. And, um, the tendency historically of sea transport has been extremely conservative so our mindset so to say is very much at the age of the sailing ships and that has been a big struggle over the years to, to make this uh, ship owners community say hey you we got GPS we got uh, electronic warnings we got people uh, claiming just in time deliverance and so forth and there's and uh, ship owners say, well, we have this big risk, we can't, uh, we can't compensate for that, and it's been a, a, a battle going on. So, is the world totally unimodal? Luckily not. We have this UNCTAD ICC rules, the network principle. That means that if you can locate the damage to one specific transport leg, uh, you use the rules applying to that mode of transport. Uh, let's say if you have a container coming all the way from China to, to Molde and uh, there is a land, law, land egg, well it might go to Ondalsnes and to give you a practical example and you open that container, it's, it's filled up with uh, seawater and I say well it didn't actually happen during the, the land transport, it was pretty clear so then you should have the, the rules of liability, those are for the, for the sea freight but on many occasions it's very difficult to find it out and um, then in, in normal practice at least according to the insurance companies the last the rules all the last transport leg prevail so 
So, uh, does this matter? Yes, it does, it's the short answer. Um, at least, um, well, what questions do international transport conventions uh, address? They address the, um, the contracts issues, who are the parties here, and their obligations of the sellers. The sellers, they basically had to um, cost provide the proper goods to uh, package them properly and also s have the proper signing o on the, uh, the proper um, marking of the goods. And um, also this goes with dangerous goods. Uh, if they are not uh, properly marked, it might be quite a problem. I can just give you one example from Kina Nagel. We had a new customer from Bergen and they, they happened to uh, have dangerous goods according to international rules. And this kind of goods you can't put into a container with anything else. So actually they didn't tell the, our, uh, my colleagues anything, so they just organized for a tr um, container where these goods were stuffed together with all this. As you know, it's much, much better transport economy to cons consolidate consignments. But then it turned out that uh, you couldn't have these goods in that container with the other goods at all, so you had to unload the container. And um, so that was quite uh, raw with this uh, owner of goods. Uh, you, you have the obligation of the transporter to basically to take care of the goods when they're in their custody. Uh, and then your compensation for loss and damages, I'll come back to that, and compensations for delays. There are also claims and deadlines. And this, really, <laughs> people, is a kind of strange world that because in air freight, you might think that was that is well at least on um, longer distances, 500 uh, kilometers uh, above. This is of course um, the quickest way of transport, and you have the express companies like DHL, TNT, UPS, and say we are a, we are express companies. We have on-time deliveries, but if you're in that kind of transport, you have 14 days to complain if the goods are not arrived, if they're damaged. Whereas in sea transport, it's been a um, better number than traditionally, you just had three days to complain. And I can still remember from my time in Kina Nagel, I say, people complaining, I say, two months after the goods uh, had arrived, you're too late, case closed, no chance. So, and then it's important to have uh, your goods insured as well. So, uh, in real life, be very much aware of these um, rules or procedures. You also have force majeure, uh, meaning that you couldn't foresee it, you couldn't take into account. And uh, for you writing about political risk, that might be an important issue. Because if something comes up like uh, lightning, you say, well, we couldn't uh, be aware of that, but please don't say that you didn't know that there were pirates uh, outside Somalia. Somalia, This is a pretty well-known fact, and if you don't take that into account, you, um, you haven't done your, so to say, your home lesson. So, um, so force majeure is important, but... Um, uh, and you have that with storms, with uh, strikes and so forth. You have, not to go into details, but international law, you have um, acts of God. Actually, this is a pretty common expression, legal expression in uh, Anglo-American law. And that is, to some extent, very much like force Bajor, but it's the not quite the same. It's a more narrow sense. For example, strikes. And which exporters of salmon had quite some problems in France, as you might know, over the years, because you might have, yeah, they have strikes have occurred, and then the roads are blocked, and uh, you it's very easy to get um, the goods uh, transported to the customers. And um, if this have a kind of wild kite stri strikes, and you're not aware of them, they might be defined as force majeure, but acts of God. You cannot uh, hold God liable for the strikes, to put it uh, to, to put it in that way. And also, can you have formalities related to the conventions as such? The the 
um, the challenge here really is that in all the big transport companies you have claims department and then you, there you have people knowing these rules very well. There is on the vulnerable goods, whether they be export companies, import company, they mostly don't know these rules at all. So uh, that's also a, a case for using the transport insurance uh, companies because they have, um, they sort of say, match the expertise of, of the transport companies. As I mentioned to you, the logistic service provider is the principal or an agent. You, uh, you should be very well aware of that. For European uh, road transport, uh, they mostly are. And uh, according to the rules of the Nordic uh, um, Freight Forwarders Association, if I say it's in my name, it's written specifically like in an argle here on the freight document. And if it's very part of my marketing, Kinan Angle does it all, the all the um, inclusive uh, provider of uh, transport, then you're sort of stuck. But um, I experienced on quite a few occasions uh, specific specifically with sea freight and even more so with air freight that I say, well, we uh, booked a freight from KLM, uh, Air France, from Lufthansa, and so something went wrong somewhere in Africa. And well, you should ask Lufthansa, it's not our business. So, um, that uh, you, you should be aware of uh, this. And it might be actually much easier to to have one person to get to get in touch with them. I mean, if you're booking transport, um, that is worth uh, checking out. How about compensation? And as I mentioned, in the world of transport, weight of the goods prevail. You have uh, diff somewhat different rules in um, in sea transport. You may also have according to the number of, um, of crates or, or uh, packages uh, that might be um, more uh, a better rule. You have SDR. What is an SDR? Anybody have some idea? If you have the big currencies of the world, you take a dash or US dollar, you take a dash or a Japanese yen or uh, Euros and the British, you know, ha don't have the euro, so they have the pound, and you have a trade weighted balance. You find that if in which stock it changed, if you look at that website on the XDR, so um, it is actually special drawing right, and uh, it's important to be aware of this. Could uh, I say artificial currency? I say if you look at Norwegian. Oslo Börs, which is talking to XDR. And generally speaking, mind you, this is not, uh, this is not the answer with two lines uh, below, but it's generally around nine Norwegian kroners. What does that mean then? Traditional then, if you had sea freight, you would go be compensated um, to uh, well, nine kroners, you're yeah, 18 kroners, Norwegian kroners per kilo. So you can just ma imagine if you have valuable goods. Le let's take uh, just Glamox here. There's a neighbor factory, and they have some very valuable goods. For them, it would be just like hell if you just get compensated 18 kroners per kilo. If you're a stone producer in Larvik with uh, granite, uh, well, well, that will do. But uh, that's rather the, the exception than the rule. Where is, when you have road transport, you have 833, then it's, well, something like 8, 9, 70 kroners, rail, somewhat more, and air. Um, that is quite logical because, as you, you certainly know, if you go by uh, weight, the, air tr <coughs> the, the importance of air freight is um, just a trifle of international transport, uh, but if you calculate by value, you have a fairly um, good hyper. Well, at least uh, you can you can see it on the statistics that uh, the importance of air freight. 
And um, for that, uh, one practical uh, question uh, related to that. If you, I if you, uh, suppose you read in your textbooks that today many of the so-called air freight consignment, they do, as a matter of fact, at least in Western Europe, they go by truck or by um, other means of transport, <coughs> mostly by truck to um, to Schiphol, to to Frankfurt, to London, and to Heathrow, all to the big um, airports, because they have uh, the, the, the volume to consolidate the goods. But if, uh, if it's on an air freight uh, way bill, this uh, transport document related to air freight, you, you still get compensated uh, 19 STR per kilo. Of course, in the law there are uh, mostly exceptions, and, uh, and one of the exceptions is a gross neglect by the transport companies. Then you get full com uh, compensation. But I tell you that is very rare. You have this classical example of a bridge being uh, four meter and twenty high, then you come up with a truck being four meter and fifty high. It crashes with the bridge, and you say, "Which?" Say, so, "Well, isn't that gross negligence?" It's in Norway, but it's not in Denmark. So you can say even that is not gross Netherlands. Uh, and so it takes very much. It was in our uh, uh, suitcase law before this when we had somebody with big boots and you, you could see their marks on the packages. And they, those packages, when you have, <coughs> well, they were crushed, as you can imagine. That was gross negligence. But in relations with the transport companies, you should take normally a support of the part of that this is what you get compensated. And does this weight and prices at all relate to the commercial value of the goods? Of course you also have these force majeure clauses, then you have no compensation at all, because the transport company they couldn't foresee, they couldn't take into account, they couldn't prepare for this storm, this strike, whatever, uh, that mountain, uh, this uh, innovation on this mountain uh, uh, in uh, Norway that would just crush and uh, f uh, con have a catastrophe. Or if you claim after the deadline, so as I say, then in the procedural rule, you're uh, kind of stuck. Or if you haven't fulfilled the, your, the obligations. Of course, my first line of defense being afraid for to say, hey you, you haven't properly packaged the goods. This would go to hell. This, I mean, uh, this is a pre-warning on the catastrophe. You haven't properly marked your goods. Uh, who the hell know where the, the consignee is for in this case? Or uh, you didn't tell me that this was dangerous goods. Of course, uh, be, uh, in the real world, you, I mean, you should have this, these things in order in order to, to claim from the transport company. And then, all the goods on time. You can see the, um, you can see the brochure from all uh, freight forwarding companies saying, we're on time, we're reliable, trust us. But as I tell you, in international transport it's fairly complex. And uh, when it comes to, well, might come to rail transport, it's a cold picture, but perhaps not quite on time. So, how do you get compensated then? Huh? In road transport, you got compensating according to freight costs. But of course, if your goods, uh, if you have transport costs to um, Turkey, Istanbul, your customers are for, let's say, 30,000 kroners. But the, the, val the value of consignments happened to be 1 million kroners. And uh, suppose that this was fresh salmon, and you could just bet that the, uh, the Turkish. Um, and buyer wouldn't uh, the, the commercial value of this um, uh, salmon being um, having stayed on a, in a warehouse and uh, the freezing system not functioning would definitely not be worth a million kroners. In rail transport, the compensation you get is three times the freight cost. In air transport, you say the equivalent of of uh, 
of um, it's 19 str per kilo so that's equivalent to the goods being deal, uh, destroyed or uh, lost in the sea transport uh, you there has been quite um, resistance as I mentioned from the, the ship on the side say oh you know at sea we have uh, these are important expressions pork estimated time of departure estimated time of arrival so about this about that uh, we couldn't know exactly we have to take uh, be aware we, you can't uh, charge us for that and with the new Rotterdam co convention it was an intense discussion that the, the ship or the community said oh no we won't make any promise there is an article 21 where you have on certain conditions that you might get compensation owing to delay but of course you have the market pressure also being uh, um, interesting I don't know some students uh, in a former class in this course they wrote uh, an, uh, um, a thesis on uh, Daily Maersk. They have actually, Daily Maersk have a compensation uh, program, but this goes to various routes, and if you take into account that you book the transport on BM. And you find today, it should also be said that um, in short sea shipping, some of the companies are, you can find on their website that. Uh, um, the the variances uh, in uh, the transport time I don't t honestly don't always trust these statistics but uh, they're improving but th this they do as a market adaption according to legal rules they could well if you it will be a hard case um, you could um, uh, have trouble in, in getting through with that in court actually of course you always have the op opinion to say that you're unreliable I, I go for another transport company but when you can uh, listen to freight forwarders and others speaking between themselves they are very much aware of this uh, issue and this is important also <coughs> we actually should come back to inco terms because you been quite a few cases actually where the where the sellers in export companies say well door to door transport uh, time promise uh, no no problem but um, what happened with the Swedish export companies for example uh, in um, say where the um, the company their um, uh, the 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 place where the goods the, the destination of the goods for someone in the desert in uh, Saudi Arabia and say well door to door consignment no problem the problem was really that there was no road leading up to this place so they had to build the last three kilometers to get there with this heavy equipment so you can just uh, the time and promise and not at least to the cost you well it's not a bad guess that uh, this was a very uh, unprofitable business okay then uh, as I mentioned uh, transport insurance is important to bridge the gap because transport insurance in contrary to um, to transport law uh, takes into account the value of the goods plus 10% uh, in many occasions and um, because that is a kind of estimated profit, so to say, that is calculated into that. And you address the transport risk goods, uh, the re transport risk goods is, are the goods at risk, and if the goods are damaged or um, lost, lost being stolen. Perhaps you should just uh, mention this issue, uh, because what does happen in international transport? You can say on the news, oh my god, this uh, airplane fell down, the, this container ship sunk in the Atlantic Ocean, I mean, uh, the truck crashed and over the cliff, and oh boy, what happened to the dryer, what happened to the goods? Those are the kind of dramatic news, but in the real world, folks, what does most accident does most frequently happen? Any idea? 
what are the statistically speaking the most dangerous uh, operations in internet transport it's the unloading and reloading of goods more than 40 percent of the accidents are attributed to that so what's number two theft you won't have the like transport companies uh, they won't like to talk about that but just to give you one example um, I was at Schiphol some years ago and uh, it we were on a sighting tour in this enormous warehouse uh, at the Schiphol airport and uh, all of a sudden our guys said well there are quite a few goods stolen here every day um, and I was kind of being there as a journalist and said hey, could you repeat that please and then he said oh well uh, don't write that so but that's quite a problem. I've been with express companies and then you have securities, security tasks and other uh, people saying watching these people staying here. I don't say that uh, most people working in the transport business are crooks. They aren't, certainly are. They're doing a uh, good job but it does happen and you should be aware of that. The third most common cause is um, uh, uh, goods being uh, destroyed uh, going to the intrusion of seawater. Uh, for example, you had a Norwegian um, co coffee importer in Western Norway. I want to be more accurate because then you would at least you the Norwegians would know who I'm speaking about. They were having very they would have low transport cost. They were making the most pressure on the the logistic service provider and he ended up using very lousy containers with holes and you can just imagine uh, coffee with a flavor of salt water I wouldn't uh, recommend that really so uh, that what could happen in sea transport so the most common uh, risks in international transport is not related to this dramatical news but um, the C terms in transport insurance only cover this minimum, uh, the, the ship sinking and the airplane falling down. Therefore most go for the A insurance, meaning it's all inclusive. But the snag is that if you have an insurance contract yourself, there are always these small letters saying there are some exceptions. And if, the, for example, the goods are on board ships, if there are... Um, um, goods with um, free term ter ter thermal goods and uh, um, that you might have some extra insurance you might also have insurance for bringing uh, goods into your countries for example during the Iraqi war um, uh, there were no insurance companies uh, will being willing to insure is you writing about Russia? If you write some, in, if you ask some insurance companies if you take the the goods store to door, um, might be pretty high insurance premiums. And uh, you had a one tradition in Russia when you had this uh, armed people following the goods transport inside Russia, and that uh, especially gone for places in Siberia, and uh, you have some con ex special soldiers following goods and uh, well that could add a considerable amount of money to to the goods for example so um the insurance cover is an important decision there might be extra clauses being uh, of importance and um, but of course the good news are that the value of goods are uh, insured not uh, the weight of the goods um, and uh, also the, the insurance companies have their surveyors but of course if this will be a case for the courts can you prove it and you have people surveying goods it's also very important to take into account what the insurance uh, companies say um, because uh, in real world uh, most uh, sellers and buyers want to lower the transport cost and they say well 
uh, how, why should we care about these uh, inspectors from insurance companies? Just to mention one story, you had uh, cables exported from Norway, you had from, um, from northern Norway, and it was winter time. And uh, the inspectors from the insurance company say, "You, I would definitely advise you to have an, uh, to have this uh, properly strapped and secured ab aboard. Uh, this uh, enormous cables weighing 10, 20 tons and so forth. And say, well, that's too expensive. It will cost us some 50, something between 50 and 100 tons and kronos. Well, this was really a consignment with, uh, well, at least I think 10 million." Uh, uh, US dollars. So they skipped that inspection. It actually was a heavy storm over the Atlantic o Ocean. These cables went loose. A kind of a horror film. You can just imagine being on the deck and a cable of 20 tons coming against you. They crashed everything on the deck. It was, well, a very bad business, to repeat it shortly. Um, the last um, thing about the freight forwarders uh, declaration. Here again, you should be aware of that what I'm talking about now are the Nordic rules. If you go to Germany, you have other rules. You have the FIATA, that is the international organization of the freight forwarders. They do have some standard rules, but <coughs> basically, this uh, NSAB, uh, as they call them, Nordic Disk Speditors for Bundesland in Lebestemmelser in uh, Norwegian. They are an extract from international transport conventions. So, but they are mostly um, um, inspired by uh, the road transport convention that we say. So they, uh, where they especially of interest are in areas which are not in uh, or not or insufficiently dealt with by uh, transport conventions. And you c as you know, in modern logistics, warehousing, um, customs clearance, other service, not just related to the physical transport as such, but kind of adjacent services, are also imp important to meet the um, obligations of the seller or the buyer and to make the goods flow properly. And these kind of questions are typically not covered by the uh, traditional and transport conventions, and here this uh, forwardless regulations came into play. You also have this uh, multimodal transport. I, I mentioned to you the networking principle. Where can you locate the tr the the the, um, the where the goods being uh, destroyed or, or lost, or, or and uh, then do you deal with a road transport convention, the sea transport convention, the air transport convention, and so forth. Um, they also deal with the roles, being the freight forwarder, being a principal or an agent. They deal with delay and responsibility. Lien, that's something special, it's called Pant in Norwegian. Uh, that actually, for first of all, had to do with uh, one of the, for example, the, um, the well, the, those who book transport, if they go broke, if they're not able to pay, the freight forwarder might. Um, um, I say that now we have the ownership to the goods and they m m may sell them to compensate for their uh, the costs. The other questions are to the storage of goods and uh, there might be uh, goods destroyed, theft, things uh, related to that. Uh, how about uh, liability for export and uh, import customs ser uh, documentary service? Third and fourth party logistics. If you, for example, take Norwegian uh, imports of spirits and wines and some of the big players in Norway, they, are th they actually have any uh, quite a few small import companies and say, well, this logistic is that complicated that we would just sort of say legi legally buy the goods and sell them. We would get we'd be the contract uh, signing people, but the very transport, the warehousing, we would just leave to you. <coughs> and uh, well, it's a more, more much more comprehensive uh, operations and uh, physical transport and such. 
And how about electronic data interchange and liability? Say, well, it's about that uh, story of a, a bride coming to the church and uh, the their uh, bridegroom and uh, standing there and another bride and say, uh, didn't you read my email? So I mean, uh, some misunderstandings and the consequences of misunderstandings. So uh, did you really receive this message? Was it a proper format? Uh, could you read it? Could you take it into account? And you also have this question of tenders and that is also a, a, an issue in the real world. I don't know. Quite a few freight forwarders are uh, angry about this because if you're really going to make a tender for a big company, you have to to make your calculations, your assumptions, uh, uh, to check out what what is the service levels, what are the expectations. It may take quite long time to come up with a professional um, tender, and then if you have to say, well, you don't keep pay a dime for that tender; it's just a part of competition. Uh, or if you should get paid for that, or of course, if I'm not too ethical, I get this offer from uh, Schenken and said to Queen and Nagel, hey, I just um, blacken out all what's in Schenken and said, I go to Queen and Nagel and say, can you match this? That happens in the real world, and uh, you may say that's unethical, but. Uh, it's, uh, sorry to say, part of real life on some occasions. Uh, then, if you have a clause of secrecy, you could be liable to some uh, charges. Well, um, so far, we that was uh, issues uh, being dealt with in uh, transport law. Do you have any questions? Just to sum up then, you have this unimodal perspective uh, so, uh, where is multi international transport in practice often is multimodal, you use various means of transport. You have these uh, limitations as to liability, mostly related to weight, not to the value of goods. You have the roles of the transport companies, are they principals or agents? And um, of course, you have these force majeure uh, questions coming up. And then finally, many uh, export and import companies uh, use transport I insurance in order to take account or if there is some loss, damages, delays, um, they get compensate for the real value of the goods. Okay, now we take the last break and we start up at 12. Uh, can you do with the 10 minutes break? Yes, fine. <coughs>